I would like to know your desert island skincare products. I need to lie down and think about this. <laughs> Caroline Hirons has been named the queen of skincare. Her back to basics approach has earned her millions of fans across the world. The next day your skin looks like you've had a head full of Botox. The earlier you start, the less you need as you get older. What would you recommend for someone who's currently having acne issues? If someone is having further problems with their skin, where would you recommend that people start building their routine? So what would you recommend for someone who's struggling then with acne scarring? What would be the biggest piece of advice you'd give to anyone about getting their skincare right? Where do I start? Oh, you guys are in for an absolute treat today. I cannot tell you what you have in store. If you fall under any of the following categories, are someone who uses skincare, are someone who wants to use skincare, are someone who has skin, you are going to love this episode. I have been such a big fan of Caroline for so long because I really, 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 really respect people who pursue their interests in an industry obviously before it was exciting I mean that goes without saying but also you know it's not always easy to predict where the industry is going to go and I'm sure for some people that doesn't you know work out very well but for people like her that have stuck to their guns and stuck to their expertise and created incredible personal brands and value add content purely based on the fact that they've not compromised their authenticity I think she is, well, I'll give her a proper intro in a sec, but I think she is one of the best influencers out there. And I think that that is no mean feat. So I really wanted to get her on to not only talk about her career and kind of how she got to where she is now, but to give us all a how-to in skincare 101, what we should be using, what we shouldn't be using, what we should be using for acne, what we should be using for eczema, when we should be going to a dermatologist, when we should be going to a facialist, myth busting, all of the things we didn't know but should know, how to look out for good products, etc., etc., etc. She answers it all in this episode. This was so educational for me and I think I would have to pay, have had to pay thousands for that consultation and I got it free all because of you so thank you so much and also you're welcome for having this consultation um I hope you really enjoy this episode I think it is a really 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 great one um I think you'll really enjoy it let me know what you think in the comments if you are on a platform that can leave comments and if not please make sure to rate subscribe follow a like again whatever is relevant on your platform it helps us to have amazing guests like this um and as you can clearly see i am very passionate about 360 life improvement by just listening to really interesting people and knowing things that we need to know no matter what topic they might be about so today is skincare grab a cup of tea settle down get your headphones on and go for a hot girl walk because this is full of the skincare tea. Thank you so much for joining me. Thank you for having me. I'm very excited. I feel like part of this will be a consultation that I would really have to pay a lot of money for. So it's actually <laughs> just like a way of getting free advice. Okay. Yeah. Okay. How oh, do you feel all about good? That? You feel oh, good. All good. Yeah. <laughs> um. So I wanted to start by talking about your career and how you've got to where you are now. For people who don't know your background, um, could you give a little whistle stop tour of how you've got to where you are now? Well, my first job was when I was 15 in retail. I started in beauty in 97. Mm -hmm. um, I needed a weekend job while my two eldest children were sort of, you know, young and they were at school during the week and things. And first day there, I fell in love with it and mm. thought, this is really good. And I love this. And I've always loved dealing with people and interacting. And, and I didn't leave beauty after that. And my mum and grandmother were both in the industry, but in very different roles and never really left the sales floor, particularly didn't go into management. And strangely, I, it was strange that we'd never spoken about me going into beauty. So when I went for this Saturday, Sunday job, I mean, it used to be literally called a weekend girl, you know, that's how old I am. But when I went for this job, my mum was like, oh, that would be nice. It was just very, you know, it wasn't, mm. yes, of course you need to work in beauty. That's what we did. It was just, it was a, this sort of fits a need. And I was working on the Aveda counter in Harvey Nichols. And then I never, I haven't left beauty since. I just loved it. And then I worked my way up. I moved to Space NK, was store management, and then moved to uh, Shantikai, looked after them for five years. And then slowly from there, um, started consulting, started a blog, 
the blog took off. And that kind of sounds like it's a nutshell, but it's like 25 years worth. Right. And <laughs> 26, <laughs> 27 years worth. I don't know. Yeah. And I obviously, I think it's so clear when consuming your content, how much each of those, I guess, areas of your career has actually lent to the advice you give now because mm. it's obviously not just from the point of view of a I mean there's not just a single point of view at all that mm. it's coming from when you how did you first get into I guess the product side from being in a retail situation to I guess learning more about what was necessarily in the products and what made them good and why you would go for them I think I'd got into the product side immediately because right. I was in skincare of course. And so, you've so got to sell it somehow. yeah, you want to know that what you're recommending to people works um, and keep on top of trends and newness and all that sort of stuff. So I was always into what was in the product that would make it work um, from that from that aspect. And then in terms of sort of moving from shop floor to management to sort of UK management to Europe management to looking after the, that sort of, you know, Middle East, Far East, it kind of is a natural pr procession of things. But I never felt comfortable working in corporate. Mm. So I always steered away. I always worked for sort of smaller independent brands and steered away from big corporate. But what that gave me by chance, really, I mean, I wasn't planning it that way, is a much closer relationship with everything from the beginning of a product's life until it goes on the shelf and is sold. So I knew where to source things. I knew labs, I knew scientists, I knew packaging. I knew the best people to go to for every component. Mm. And, and if I'd stayed in corporate and just maybe just stayed as like a UK, UK sales manager or something, I don't think I'd, it would have been much harder. I'm maybe, maybe still would have been in this position, but it would have been a much harder journey for sure. And what, I guess, gave you that thirst to start not just learning necessarily your specific job role, but actually to start, you know, because I'm sure you could have sat in those positions and also not taken in a lot mm -hmm. of that information. Where did that, I guess, relatively sudden interest come from the point that you were doing a weekend job on a beauty counter to moving to actually, actually, I want to learn all about this and I'm really interested in knowing more and more and more. I think, well, natural inquisitiveness. Mm. And I always want to know, I've, I've always wanted to do my best work no matter what I was doing. You know, if I'm a Saturday, Sunday girl or I'm working in my mum's shop when I'm 15, I'm going to make sure I'm doing a good job. So I think that's one aspect, generally being nosy, you know, wanting to keep learning. I always want to ask questions. And so not just... I mean, the upshot of it is probably that I just never take what people will tell me at face value. Mm. There's always that side of me that goes, right, so <laughs> I am that person, you know, I used to be that person in meetings. I would be, well, if we do that, why would you do that when you could, you know, the sort of inquisitiveness was there. Mm. So in terms of going deeper into skincare and going back to, because I went back to college to become a qualified facialist and, you know, I knew I needed the piece of paper. I knew I needed a deeper education. I knew I didn't want to sort of stand on a counter and say, this will do X, Y, Z. If I didn't know that it did that, I didn't want to take everything at face value. It was a lot of questioning. So I think it was a, a natural progression, to be honest. Mm. And when you started the blog, what in particular was that kind of blogging about? Initially, it was beauty industry. Um, I mean, the, the very first iteration of the blog was about the kids and funny sort of mum and kid stories. Then I realized literally after about two weeks that the kids wouldn't be happy with me sharing all of that almost without their permission if they were younger as they grew up. And so I changed it to beauty. And because skincare was my speciality, it was again one of those things where if I'd have followed the trend, I may have got lost in the noise, but I didn't because Back in the days of donkeys and carts of blogging, I mean, it was literally blogspot.co.uk, if you can imagine, which still occasionally comes up on the old, you know, I was like, wow, okay. <laughs> you know, because we're like, what, 13 years ago or something. Um, everyone was doing makeup, nails were massive, you know, hair. Your nails do look lovely, by oh, the way. thanks. I don't sorry. do them, so. Yeah. <laughs> Can't take the credit. Can't well, take the credit. Well, you've made the choice and it's Can't take amazing. Um, but, I, but I instinctively stuck with what I knew, which was skincare. And there really wasn't anyone else doing it. So it was, 
it was just serendipity, really. It was, you know, I was a little bit older than a lot of people who, who were blogging. I was qualified. I already worked in the industry. Um, and I think that gave me uh, a trust, a sort of certain, you know, you're coming in at a higher trust level. Mm. Um, and I and that's kind of what kick-started everything, really. And so was it a lot of kind of reviewing products specifically or, you know, saying that you liked them, didn't like them, doing evaluations of the ingredients? What were the gen- blog posts generally? Originally, uh, it was a bit of both, but the most popular posts from day one were the how-tos or the cheat sheets. Okay. You know, like the very first post I put up was how to cleanse your face properly and how to do like a cleansing facial massage. SEO friendly as well. And it's still, I knew nothing about that. Yeah. Nothing. I still don't think like that. Mm. I just don't, you know. But I... I re- it was obvious really quickly that people needed help and that a lot of people were intimidated going into stores and into counters. Mm-hmm. And also it, it was, I've always, I think because of working in places like Space and K back in the day, I had always had multi-brand training. Mm. So being trained in like 200 brands is certainly helpful and not recommending everything from one brand was sort of different then. You know, it wasn't about, oh, you have to use everything from the same brand or you don't get the same benefits, which I immediately said, well, that's not true. Mm -hmm. You know, so things like that were immediately popular. Having an opinion was popular. Mm. And I I think, you know, now, I don't know, I think now online life is so different that it's, you're almost discouraged from having too strong of an opinion. Right. Whereas if I hadn't have had one, I wouldn't have had a career. Well, it's so interesting because I've talked about this on the podcast before. I, like, I definitely at one point shied away from having too much of an opinion online because it invites more yeah. criticism. You can't more, be bothered. You're like, like whatever. Yeah, I'm just like, <laughs> honestly, I just want to go to bed. <laughs> like, please. Um, so I kind of definitely shied away from it more in order to make myself more palatable just for, you know, for a few years after the point that I you know, things had really started taking off. And I was like, this is just, I want to make sure I'm disrupting as little as possible all of this. And then I kind of realized that, first of all, that's so not me. Mm-hmm. I'm a very opinionated person. And I also, I'm also, I, I don't like hurting anyone's feelings. I don't like, I'm no. not a kind of abrasively opinionated no. person, but I believe it's good to have opinions about things. And I do naturally as a person. So I realized as well that like the people I love most online are always the people who are the most straight talking and the most opinionated. Because at the very least, even if you disagree with it, you know, it's like usually not correct. It's usually true to themselves. And it's usually kind of, it is a stance. And I always enjoy following those people more. And I realized after kind of few years in, I was like, huh, I'm trying to make myself more palatable and actually making myself to myself more unlikable. Mm. And also the type of person who I guess I wouldn't, like it's just quite bland. hang out with, yeah. Mm. I mean, there's a difference between being black and white and having nuance. Mm, You know, you can absolutely have nuance and you certainly learn how to talk to people better, you know, I mean, I, I certainly, as much as I used the years and years of working with people in the retail world, essentially what I was doing was doing what I'd always done in store, but online. Mm. I just moved it online, mm. you know, in a similar way that like Jamie did, Jamie Genevieve and Sam and Nick Chapman, everyone who's ever been like a shop floor person, you can tell as well, because there's a certain level of grafting, you know, they're, they're the people who are always working and and I, I love it. And I still, when I go in now to visit stores, I'm happy to stand there all day. You know, I just opened um, Space and K in Liverpool for the brand and I was stood there for like eight hours. They were like, you need lunch. I'm like, ah, fine, I'll get a sandwich later. Because mm. I just love talking to people. And I was selling other people's product in the store. Mm. I just went straight back to my default, which is, well, I use everything from every other brand. You know, I use everything. Mm. And so I, I think in terms of having the opinion and not, it comes from a very, um, I think, particularly female problem of wanting to be liked, Mm. which, uh, you know, the disease to please is something that I'm very glad that my daughter doesn't particularly have. Really? Mm. What a blessing. Isn't it? (laughs) It is. Sometimes I'm like, you could be, you could have the disease to please me. I know, I know. But you know. (laughs) I have that with one of my sisters as well. I'm like, love that you're not a people pleaser. Big people pleaser here. Love that. Would also love some more pleasing of myself. You could please me. Yeah, that'd be really nice. But like you say, there's a difference between going in hard and, hurting people's feelings Mm. and being negative for the sake of it. I never wanted to be negative for the sake of it. Right, sure. But it didn't stop me from saying, you know, I did a video once uh, quite a few years ago now that was um, 
love the juice, shame about the packaging. Because mm. we've all used something where you're like, this packaging is shit. Yeah. But the product is amazing. Mm. And, you know, and that got pushed back from some of the brands. But then in the end, some big corporations changed their packaging. Mm. And I know that the, the impetus of that was me saying, the juice is great. Why are you trying to make it hard for me to apply? Right, exactly. You Which know. I think is such a lesson in kind of sticking to your guns. And as we said, like, also being able to consider nuance and consider other people's opinions and all of this. However, you are qualified to give your own opinion at all times. Like mm -hmm. whether it's the right thing to do or the right space to do it is a completely different matter. But it's so clear that you've built your brand, not just not just the physical brand of Skin Rocks, but your kind of personal brand as well, purely based off the fact like, there's a reason why when I go into something like Space NK, like I've told you, when I don't know something, mm -hmm yours is a resource that I use in order to be able to, because I know there's something that I'm gonna look at and I'm gonna, I'm the type of person who I definitely have that, whatever that disease is where you see something's more expensive and therefore think it's it more must effective. Be <laughs> like I, honestly all the time. And I, it, actually being able to kind of check it out and understand that, you know, someone like you is going to be able to give an honest opinion. Definitely must've been a difficult thing. It definitely must've been a difficult thing for you to do in the shorter term. Because I can imagine at the beginning when you're wanting to work with brands, at least to a certain extent, like it is a certain badge of honor within an industry. Yeah. How did you balance the desire to want to work with brands and want to, I guess, further your career in, in that way whilst also wanting to make sure you were as honest as possible? To be honest, it wasn't that hard mm. because I've always had, where I do have black and white is brands I would never work with for whatever reason or products I would never endorse, anything considered weight loss, mm. stretch marks, mm -hmm. anything like that, you know, I'm like, whatever. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you couldn't pay me enough. Yeah. So that's easy. Um, in terms of working with brands, I, I genuinely didn't go after brand deals. I was working and consulting for a long time before I said, right, actually I need to stop now and just do the blog because they started to cross pollinate in a way that wasn't healthy. So I would have consulting clients who would expect to be put on the blog and wanted to wanted to use my blog. It's a compliment, but it's also a piss take. They wanted to mm. use the blog to announce their new product or to do a launch, but as part of my consulting gig. Right. Then. And I had made it completely clear at the beginning, look, I'm happy to help you do whatever you want and grow your business. I want nothing else but the success of your business, but you have to understand that the blog is always separate. Yeah. And I love the opportunity it gives me to talk about your product and to maybe get a sneak peek, but you can't expect that. No, absolutely. It's, you know, and so eventually I was like, this is too much of a pain in the ass. Mm. And I'm big enough now to say, okay, I'm not going to consult. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I, I at one point took the decision to, I, I took a pretty significant decision at one point to concentrate on the businesses that I was building rather than social media purely, but for a number of different reasons, partly because I felt I was better suited to that as a day-to-day -day job. Like I, I work better with people. I like mm -hmm. to be I like to feel fulfilled by my work by not that it's not yeah not that it's not fulfilling to be doing kind of the more influencer stuff but it is it's it's quite lonely it's no, there's not a lot of kind of I guess conversation a lot of yeah. these things and all of that so actually I bring this up because I at that point that I was able to move away and able to build up the businesses to an extent that I was no longer relying on the influencer stuff for my income I also realized that that was such a luxury in terms of being able to, you know, you can see why people would want to impress certain brands mm -hmm. or never want to do them down mm -hmm. in order to be able to make a better income. And yeah. I always see it as such a luxury that I'm able to, I guess, turn things down and say no to something purely, but it's like, I don't, I don't rely on it. I like to think that I would do that anyway, mm. but you know, I'm in a fortunate position where actually, you know, maybe it's that I don't need the money or like whatever it might be in order to be able to make the best decision in that moment. But I can imagine that's not always, and it's not always as black and white as say like the stretch mark products. It's not always easy because obviously as well, I needed the money. We had mm. kids, mm. you know, I had four kids by the right. time I started the blog. So when I started the blog in 2010, Max, the youngest would have been five, turned six that year. Um, and so I had four kids to feed, house, clothe, you know, and obviously my husband was there, but you still always have that. Well, of course, it's my responsibility. So I always wanted to, that's why I consulted and kept consulting for so long when I could have made a fortune switching to just doing the blog work and social media and sponsored posts. But number one, it's that ultimate bet on yourself, mm. which is like, oh, but if I don't have the retainer, 
income from consulting and I do love the consulting. I mean, I do it now for free, you know, for smaller brands. I'm like, can I just give you a little bit of advice? Yeah, and they're please. like, yes, please. And I'm like, okay, could you do that? And they're like, oh my God. So, and I love doing it. It just became, okay, I need to, I can make more money doing the other. Mm. Yeah, and I can no, still absolutely. make money using good judgment. Yeah. You know, the money I've turned down is horrendous <laughs> because people, I, I don't know when the switch quite happened, but obviously it, it just happened that my word meant a lot in the skincare world. You know, the early signs were things like I had um, spoken about Clinique's Take the Day Off Cleansing Balm. And when I did that, it sold out worldwide. And Clinique were like at the borderline of discontinuing it because no one really knew how to use it, how to describe it. It wasn't, it's not a very Clinique product if you think about it. I mean, it's basically a greasy lardy balm. You know, it's not like you would say there's health benefits. Mm. It's a it's a traditional old makeup remover. Mm. And I said to Clinique, look, I'm getting harassed by people. Where can we buy it? Give us the balm. Give us a balm. And they gave me an official statement. And I was like, oh, wow. Estee Lauder are talking to me like I'm important. Yeah, right. And even people who I, I had friends at that point who worked for Estee Lauder, the brand, the parent company, they were like, Clinique have given you a statement. And I was like, I know. And so from that point on, it was a bit like, oh, okay. But I think if I had come into it with, well, you're going to have to give me a statement and an arrogance, it would never have yeah. worked. It, the, you have to have the humility of, it would be, like you say, the short term gain. It would have been a very short term game mm. if I had done that from the beginning. Because mm. also there's nothing more unattractive, mm. you know, to as a viewer. Because mm. I'm like you, I, I watch a lot of people. I, re, you know, I listen to a lot of pods. There's nothing more unattractive than the arrogance of, well, my word is, can't, you know, all that sort of stuff. And it's a bit... Yeah. It's just not me, you yeah. know? And the big thing is when people always say, which I'm sure you've had, you know, oh, you're, you're very opinionated. I'm like, no, I'm not. You have as many opinions as I do. I just voice them. Right. And not I, always now. Yeah. But I did in the early days, yeah. probably because of my ADHD. I see that now. Yeah. No, I really Bit of blessing. Um, I, yeah, no, <laughs> absolutely. Um, and I think kind of on that, it's so interesting because when, when I'm consuming people's content online, there's very few people who have that like, that much of an impact that their word really yeah. means that. There's a few people that kind of stand out to me. There's you, there's Melissa's wardrobe that like she really stands out to me in that way. There's a few other people that I can't, can't think of off the top of my head that genuinely can talk about a product and sell it out as if they were, I don't know, some yeah. like- Erica Davies does that for fashion. Right. Erica Davies, if she mentions one thing and I haven't seen it within 10 minutes, I know not to even bother right. because it's sold out. But that's the exact thing. And it's such a powerful, I mean, it's such a powerful tool, obviously, mm. for brands, for you, for many, many different things. It's also a huge responsibility. Yeah. Um, I know that I've had that effect in some ways before and I've yeah. almost wanted to, you know, there's been like certain- products where I'm like oh I actually like don't want to talk about it for every for whatever reason whether it's like a do, do you ever have that where it's like a negative opinion that you feel like doesn't need to be said publicly oh, yeah. yeah if it's if it's a product that I don't like for personal reasons or a brand I don't like for personal reasons then why would I bother if it gives mm -hmm. other people joy and they find it works for them knock yourselves out mm -hmm. you know I will talk about it if I think it's harmful obviously um disingenuous Pure marketing winds me up. I mean, mm. I was against clean and green mm. and everything that comes out of LA's bullshit from day one. And now we've gone full circle and it's kind of finally coming to fruition that everyone knows it's just nonsense, mm. you know? So I think, yes, if it's if it's about the end consumer and their, their skin, their skin condition, their safety, their health, their marketing, that you know, their, their money ultimately that they're being sold to, mm then I will voice the opinion no matter who it pisses off. Mm. If it's just about my ego, I don't, who cares? No yeah. one cares. Right. You know, I, I very much have that. I think being a mum of four and having a team that are all no people, mm. you know, I see people online and I think you don't have enough no people around you. Mm. I'm surrounded by them. <laughs> people I mean, love to tell me. I mean, that. I literally get, do you want to think? And they go, nah, that's a shit idea. And I'm like, okay, <laughs> brilliant. Great. Love that. Love that, love that for me. Yeah. Great. Love that. Yeah. Fine. <laughs> But you know, if it's if it's something that affects people wasting their money, mm. that winds me up. People being lied to, people being told that certain things in beauty are unsafe, that annoys me. I'll always voice that. 
But if it's just like, well, I don't really like this because it's, then why bother? Yeah. Because the other side of it is I know as much as I can build a brand, I could also equally destroy one. So I'm careful. And I don't say that with arrogance. I say it with a knowing awareness of mm. I try and go easy. There's the odd one where I don't go easy. Brad right. Pitt has no business making a skincare product. <laughs> oh, <laughs> Sorry, I don't even know if we can swear. I don't even no, ask. You but can swear. You can I mean, you're bringing me on. Like... You probably know that I'm just going to. Yeah, I don't know if you've way. ever heard me speak. But it's <laughs> yeah. like a pure, just like a string of. But you know, equally, I know that that's not going to upset or offend anyone because right. if you love Brad Pitt and you've got money, you're going to want his product. Who cares what I think? Mm-hmm. Yeah. But do you need it? Is it life changing? No, of course it's not. Yeah, it's one of those ones where it's like you, as as we kind of mentioned, you are always entitled to your own opinion, and it's exactly. the fact that people value your opinion for a number of different reasons when you look at those people who you feel like have that kind of that i don't know what it is that i really don't want to call it x factor i really don't want to but it's the only thing coming to my head right now you know that kind of just quality where they're online they can recommend something it completely sells out um and people value their opinion that highly Mm. what do you think that is like how do you think that's made built trust experience, never lying to people, never bullshitting, never trying to cover up. It's also accountability. Mm. You know, when I've made mistakes or when I've, when we've had mistakes as a business or whatever, I'm the first person to go, right, that's on me, I'll sort it, you know, or, oh God, I'm sorry, that's just me blurting, I'm out of order, you know, not recently, but obviously in the earlier years, because also things stay online forever and things come up and you're like, yeah, I was an absolute knob. You know, we're we're cool now, we've spoken, da, 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 da. Mm. It doesn't happen as much now because, you know, I'm older. And a lot of the time I don't, I think in the early days I was very susceptible to people tagging me in other people's drama, only like in skin really, in beauty, you know, mm. and me jumping in and going X, Y, Z, and this is this and this and this. And now I'm just like, oh, whatever, who has the time? I don't care. You know, if I get tagged in things like, for example, Gwyneth Paltrow saying she only really dabs SPF where the sun hits her face. And I'm like, that's dangerous. Yeah. You moron. <laughs> please more but I back it up with because some people will say well what do you know Gwyneth Paltrow might don't so I just got like 27 derms mm. to give me a statement and put it up on the blog that's what I know mm. all of these people are telling you the exact opposite thing mm. they're all doctors they cut cancer out of people for a living mm. use your SPF you know yeah. that kind of thing I'm more than happy to say don't do that mm. <laughs> if you yeah. do anything else don't do that yeah but general sort of getting involved in things and online I'm just not who cares yeah. No one cares. You know, at the end of the day, it's it's gonna it's just drama, it feeds and it's clickbait for people. And I'm just so I'm particular about when I jump in, but when I jump in, I generally jump in like Rocky Balboa. <laughs> and <laughs> there's no subtle jumping yeah, in, it's no, just like no in between. You're an asshole. Yeah, that's, yeah. Sorry, but you yeah, know no, that's fine. <laughs> um and so you're I wanna fast forward to the decision to start a brand of your own. I love your brand um i use it as you know i've posted about it completely organically and as a paid customer um because it is a favorite in my household in everyone there there are two of us but it's important opinions for us too um and i can imagine that when you were considering making a brand because you were trusted so much in opinions on other people's Mm -hmm. brands did you have a worry moment where you thought that people might think it would compromise your oh, yeah. integrity. Yeah. And and that would be, of course they would. Why wouldn't they? It's completely understandable, you mm. know, but I still, I knew uh, the proof would have to be in the pudding. So there were, of course, but equally of all the brands I've worked with over the last sort of 15, 20 years, only one brand called me and said, how are you going to handle talking about our product? If you also sell this product, just one brand, which was really good. Cause I think it showed that the brands trust me. And even the ones who didn't trust me, they knew that me talking about their brand still had a benefit, mm. you know? But it's it's been good because I just said, look, I can only show you as we go forward that I will still endorse the industry as a whole, product as a whole. I love beauty, I love skincare, I love makeup, you know? So I, I'll, I'll only be able to show you that my integrity is intact, mm. you know? And to this day, I haven't said, this is the only cleanser you ever need to use again about my cleanser Mm. because I use 25 different cleansers. Mm. You know, I love our cleanser, but I'm always going to use everyone else's product because I like to dabble. Yeah. I like to know what's out there. And equally, you know, I've said to brands, you also need to trust me that if you tell me about some groundbreaking science, I'm not going to release the same thing in the next year. Yeah. It's never been my bag. I'm Mm. going to be like, I love this. Haven't they done brilliantly? Yeah. You know, like the QRL mist. Mm. I must have sold them out of that how many times worldwide. And 
it would be easy, fairly easy to go into a lab and knock it off. Mm. Why would I do that? Mm. People would be like, well, she's just copied Purell. Mm. You have to have your integrity. I've always known what I wanted to release and how I would do it. And I just don't think there's room. I just, I'm not the type of person that wants to sort of cannibalize other people's stuff. I'm not, it's, I'd rather be collaborative. Mm. And I think that also comes from building up a brand online. But that must've been hard to a certain extent as well, even in terms of the fact that like, you know, there will be other people who do similar consistency moisturizers or Mm -hmm. cleansers or retinoid or like whatever it might be. How have you, I guess, mitigated the risk of that coming across that way when I'm sure it's the same as like fashion. It's really easy, especially like I'm in active wear. How much can you do to a legging to make it that different? Yeah. Like yeah. I, this is why I'm, I, I don't think I've ever called out anything that looks like too similar because I'm like, it's a legging. Like there are some things that I'm like, come on now. But you know, there are yeah. other things where it's like, you know, it's fashion. It's a, like, there's not much that can be yeah, changed. And also if there was a product that you loved, it's probably going to be quite close to what you would yeah. make it as like formula wise yeah. anyway. How have you managed to walk that line? Um, giving really intense briefs to scientists is mm-hmm. always a good, a good start. You know, I, you know, cause when you go to make a product, most labs will say, okay, so can we have some examples of stuff that you love? Mm-hmm. And sometimes I'll say, well, yeah, I like these, but it can't be anything like these because <laughs> so they're my, do with that because they're my friends. Right. And then they're like, oh, okay. But the, the scientists loved it. I mean, it took me like four or five attempts to get a lab. Mm. You know, we've got a couple of labs now, but to get labs that could give me a product that I wanted. Um, I think ultimately grown up brands and brands that are confident, which is most of them in fairness, they don't have that sort of, I have to keep everything into myself and hide everything like this. And they're going to know that if I'm going to release a cleanser, a moisturizer, an acid, a retinoid, an eye, whatever, there will always be similarities, but it's a different product. Of course. And I will still use other people's product and endorse it because they're fantastic. Mm. You know, you never see... I don't, I don't see professional makeup artists only ever using their own product. Mm. You know, you might do now as they get bigger. Like I'm sure Tilbury never touches anything sure. else. <laughs> but that's at a whole many billion. But that's a yeah. slightly different yeah, kettle yeah, of yeah. big fish. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Big, big fish and big, big kettle. Yeah. Um, no, I, comp- I completely see that. And I think you've done it fantastically well. I remember always thinking like, it would be so, obviously I wasn't the first person to think this, but always thinking like, oh, you would kill it with the skincare brand, but then also being like, you know, if your then whole do you do? business is the fact that you talk about other people's, like, does it, you know, like I wouldn't post about another activewear brand purely because I actually wouldn't use it. Like if I'm doing my yeah. job well, it's different from skincare, you know? Yes. But it is like, I can imagine that was like a tough line to walk in lots. And I can imagine that took a lot of like preparation, a lot of like making sure the concept was exactly right. A lot of making sure that people who you work with know that, this is how you're going to work moving forwards and yeah that. i mean i when i when i did reach out to brands that i spoke to a lot i was like look we're going to release the product in xyz and this is what we're doing first and i just want you to know that if you want to sample the product you can have it first mm. it, i'm never going to sit in front of a camera and say you only ever need to use this skin rocks is the only thing you ever need to use because that's not how i've spoken about skincare mm. my entire working career so if i started doing it now people would be like oh she's lost it right you know no no she's lost it now we need someone else to go to for advice right And I do genuinely love using other people's product. Mm. But I think that's such an important mindset. Like it really is a kind of abundant mindset in the way of not, I always talk about this, like the bigger the market, the bigger the opportunity for you as a business. Like it wouldn't make sense for you to shut down the need for any other skincare because like, you know, what someone then gets into skincare and then doesn't, it. like you're able to give them a holistic view of the entire industry. The second you take away your ability to do that, then you know, yeah. then you're a then Well, also it means I'm also then competing on the same level as everyone else. Right. Which is- And just trying to pitch for everyone's dollar. Whereas actually I'm, I'm the worst person in business. You know, I, obviously my marketing team, their job is to market the product and they would love it if I went on to Insta and did a reel that was just like, why this is the only retinoid you ever need to put on your face again. Sure. They'd be like, yes, we finally got her. And I'm like, I'm never going to do it guys. Mm. Because it's not, it's not me. You no. know, I'm still CH talking about the brand of Skin Rock. So it's mm. still- it doesn't mean, do I back my product 100%? Of course. Yeah. You know, am I proud of it? Of course. But will I? Will it stop me from using everyone else's stuff? No, never. Mm. I just, I love the whole industry too much. Yeah, no, absolutely. I think that's incredibly important and a very, very good angle that I think could be maintained in a lot of different areas. Um, I want to speak about skincare in general, unsurprisingly. Um, and 
especially for people who maybe haven't gone into their kind of skincare area mm-hmm. yet. Um, at the beginning of someone's, I guess, skincare journey, if you could call it that, what would be the biggest pieces of advice you you'd give to anyone about getting their skincare right? Buy an SPF. Don't sleep in your makeup. Don't smoke. Good ones. Short and sharp. Pretty simple. If you start there, then you're onto a winner, especially if you manage to get to like, you know, your teenagers. Mm. If you can get them into it and a routine, Mm. doing it religiously like a routine is is key. The earlier you start, the earlier you start, the less you need as you get older. Mm. Because the signs of sort of aging that most people complain about, pigmentation, wrinkles, you know, sagginess, all that sort of stuff, it's going to happen to us all eventually. You can delay it, the process a lot, though, if you're using SPF, for example. Mm. And so should we all be using SPF every day, whether inside, outside? Yeah. On your face. Yeah, if you want to help prevent, you know, if you want to sort of slow the passage of time, nothing's going to stop you aging. And why should you? You know, we're a pro-aging brand. We don't like to use the term anti-aging. If I use it, I use it in the context of letting people know what I mean because the industry has made term. it such a relative term, but we're not, we're just, you know, healthy aging is better, like healthy skin. I don't like to use the term normal for sort of a skin that doesn't really have any kind of skin condition. It's safer sort of, I think, and kinder to say balanced, mm. you know, things like that. We just try and tweak the language a bit, but in terms of a sun factor, the sun is fantastic. I love the sun, but it can, and does cause damage, you know? Mm. So I'm not saying you have to slather yourself in a beach SPF when you're going to work in the winter. That's not what I'm saying. But on your face, you can find a really sexy SPF that works well under makeup as well. You're set. For someone who wants to build a skincare routine from scratch, they want to make sure they're covering, I guess, all the bases. Maybe they are my age. So I'm 26. I recently, or not recently, I probably got into skincare properly about two three years ago and I found it very difficult to build a routine Mm -hmm. and to know what I needed and to know what ingredients and all of this that I should be avoiding or going towards what would be your I guess advice well I mean the reason we built the app is to help exactly that customer exactly because I there's only there's only one of me and if I wanted to, I worked out that when I was sort of talking about developing the app and talking to app developers, I've, I've worked out that I'd answered since the blog started approximately a quarter of a million questions. The majority of it, just doing an average of how many I do on Instagram a day, how many I do on Instagram DM, how many I was doing on Twitter and how many I was doing on the blog and in real life and putting a rough average together. I even took off if I was off on holiday, trying to be as, you know, Mm. it's like, it's gotta be like a quarter of a million minimum. That's without shop floor work before the blog. That's just since 2010. And a lot of the questions were very, very repetitive and similar. People are obsessed with pores, you know, pores, pigmentation, and where do I start? Those are kind of the big ones. You know, I I don't know what to do. I walk into a boots or I walk into a space or I look online and I just don't even know what I'm looking at you know I know I should wash my face maybe not with a shower gel and I my skin feels sore sometimes that's a kind of an easier place to start so the app the whole point of it was you fill your profile out and tell us how much you want to spend and we'll tell you or you you might have 150 products in your that are suitable for you and we'll just do it's a match and then you can choose for yourself you know it's not me pushing anything Mm. brands cannot pay to be selected is completely independent. Mm. So I had to kind of replicate what I was doing for a bigger audience. And that seemed a sensible way to do it at the time. Sure. But it doesn't stop people asking you questions. No, 4,000 questions a day. But you need to, you know, wash your face nicely at night, use moisturizer, use an SPF. It's the, a real basic way to start. Mm. And if someone is having, I guess, further problems with their skin, so they're in a position where maybe you know, maybe they've suddenly started having acne breakouts Mm -hmm. or they have been getting eczema or whatever it might be. Where would you, I know there's obviously, I I think there's a shortage of dermatologists in the UK. Um, And they're also expensive. Yeah, absolutely. And they're prohibitively expensive for the majority of people. Where would you recommend that people like that start in terms of building their routine? Yeah. I think you need advice from someone that you trust. So if that turns out to be someone like me online, if it turns out to be that you've downloaded the app, if you've got people that you like to follow 
on social media. If you like one product from a brand and that brand has counters and you can go in and talk to people there. And then it's because the other side of it, of course, is the professional side of the industry, which is going for a facial and going for a treatment. And I think the industry has changed so much from the old days of, you know, a, a facial was for most people was once or twice a year. It was Christmas and birthdays, you know, or summer holidays and birthdays. It was a treat. Whereas now you can really, you know, we can do so much in a clinic that you never really used to be able to do with product and you know, without, without a prescription or a dermatologist. Mm. And there is a chronic shortage of derms. The problem with derms, and this is being told to me by derms that I trust and who are, who are consultant derms, like proper top of their game, is that people will do their medical training, specialize in dermatology and immediately leave the NHS and go private because they want to make money, fair play. But I think they I think they have a duty to do at least a couple of years, like, like being in the army, doing a couple of years duty with the NHS to help people because, and especially with COVID, there's still a huge delay in people being seen who have things that aren't considered really important, like mm. acne, but acne is completely debilitating. If mm. you're a young person with acne, it's it can be completely debilitating, you know, but of course, skin cancer had to take priority. Of course. So there is a huge shortage of dermatologists, but there isn't a huge shortage of people who can perform facials and use lasers and do peels and all that sort of stuff. And so I think supporting the professional industry has been the other side of it that kind of came along as a nice, almost like an add-on. It was, wasn't that I hadn't done it before. It's just that I, I really got to the point where I was like, well, go and see so-and-so, go and have a facial, mm. go and, you know, and I don't mean what I would call like a, it sounds terrible, but like a generic cattle market facial, you know, where they're only trained to do one thing and there's a routine and you'll lie down and they'll nice take your eye makeup off and yeah. it's very essential oil happy and it smells nice and you fall asleep that's nice i'd rather have a massage mm, i agree. don't want a load of products that i don't i'm not aware of on my face i'd rather be zapped mute peeled you know like i want it to do i want it to hit i want it to do something mm. if i come out with a facial and i'm not pink then it hasn't been done properly not red not sore pink and juicy that's mm. what you want and how do you tell then where the difference between like what a good treatment to get would be and a not so good treatment or something that so, will like the best do nothing. A, f- a fluffy facial would mm. be probably from a corporate brand. They're all the same. They only offer like one or they do like ones that coincide with their skincare franchises. So it'll be relaxing. It'll be for sensitive skin. It'll be for problematic skin because I won't be able to use the term acne. It's not medical, you know. Uh, so you have to read between the lines. Where you'll get a better treatment as people who talk openly, on, especially on places like Instagram and show before and afters on people who use machinery. If, I want, if I'm going for a facial, I want machinery, you know, and I don't mean a steamer. I mean, lasers, you know. Um, Arms flying around the place. Yes. I, I love a good facial massage, don't get me mm. wrong, but it needs to come after I've been zapped. Yeah. And so you're going to get that more from an independent person who isn't really um, sort of not necessarily aligned with pushing product all the time and it's not that they do and these people have to make a living i don't mean it in a disrespectful fashion but you will be able to tell by looking at someone on instagram and word of mouth you know if you've got friends who said oh my god i've just had this amazing facial or if you know if you see someone and their skin looks great so your skin looks amazing what are you doing differently and sometimes they will say you know but the biggest problem the industry has is that most people want to keep those things as secrets for themselves but not you but the anti gatekeeper can you imagine <laughs> it's like they're like Oh, it's my facialist. Yeah. Or, you know, like, or, or it would be like, oh, it's my colorist. You know, it's my manicurist. You know, I don't want to have to wait. She's already manically busy. I, I can't see her for three weeks because she already can't fit people in. If mm. I give her a shout out, I'll never see her. Mm. But that's what you're up against in day-to-day life with, with your friends. You know, it's like a, the opposite effect of, you know, in, in sort of customer service experience, for example, if someone has a good, a good experience with a brand, they usually tell like three or four people in passing. If they have a bad one, they tell 20. And it's similar in a way that the people who are doing really brilliant facials and laser and peels and people who I would trust with my face, mm. that again, there's only one of them, mm. you know, there's only one of them and they can't replicate it without diluting it. Mm. So it is harder, but there are great facialists out there. It is possible to find. And when you find them, hold on to them. Yeah. And so um, I'd, I'd like to go through a few situations. Because okay. I feel like they're generally <laughs> FAQ type things. Um, and I know lots of people will listen to this, hoping for some answers for them in particular. <laughs> for someone who has developed acne for the first time in their life, 
what would you recommend in terms of a course of action, whether it is skincare, whether it is professionals, whatever it might be? It depends on, if there's quite a few factors. It depends on their age, uh, their lifestyle, and what what was the precursor. So if it's a young young person, like in their teens, and they've developed severe acne, I would say go to your GP in the UK. Go to your GP. Um, you're lucky if you if you check your local practices. Some GPs literally specialize in, in dermatology. So then they're not allowed to call themselves dermatologists because that's a protected term, obviously, as it should be, like a gynecologist, you know. But they will, they they can be GPs with a special interest in dermatology, and they will be able to do most things that a dermatologist could, outside of things like lasering and stuff that you would get if you went to a derm clinic. Uh, depending on the severity, I would go to a you know if if it was my teenager and I was concerned, I'd go to a doctor. Now, of course, I'd be able to go straight to a derm. But that is not feasible for most people. It just isn't. We don't have enough of them. And the ones we do have are bloody expensive. Mm-hmm. And that's not me taking away from their craft. You know, they've trained. They can charge whatever they want. But it does make it kind of elitist. Mm. You know, whereas if you speak to Americans, when I have Americans on Insta, in, in the comment sections and in the Freaks group on Facebook, they're all like, I don't know why you don't go to your dermatologist. <laughs> like, I know why. And everyone's like, I haven't got one, love. We go to the NHS. Like, we haven't got one. Yeah. So if, and then if it's, uh, if it's um, if it's hormonal acne in young women, for example, and it's very clearly once a month, you can treat that generally with product. It's when it's debilitating to the point of they are it's affecting their mental health, which it does. Mm. Um, it's scarring. I, I would go medical immediately. Mm. If, however, you are, you know, you're just your skin's going through a shitty phase. Go to a facialist. Mm. Go to a clinic. You know, go and have some laser, go and have some peels, um, go and get some professional advice. Because, you know, I used to say that the way of differentiating the difference between needing or, you know, wanting to use a really good esthetician, a facialist or a derm is you would go to a facialist to sort of prolong your skin health. Right. And you would in the UK, certainly you'd go to a derm if you have a real problem. Mm -hmm. That's kind of how I see most people behaving. Mm. And it is also how I generally advise people to act. Mm. You know, because if I, the first thing I do if it's, and it's usually a mum will message me and say, my teen is really suffering. The GP has given them antibiotics. We don't know what else to do. The wait is so long for a derm. Because in some areas you're looking two and a half, three years. Yeah, It's ridiculous. Um, And I say, send me a picture. And then when they send me a picture, I can immediately say, I, there's either two responses. One is, I would advise that you go to a derm privately and put it on your credit card, which I very rarely say. Right. I don't want people getting into debt. I always say, don't credit card your skincare. But to me, a debilitating skin condition. Yeah, I've had bad acne. I can. Is a mental to. health <laughs> yeah. issue as well, you know. Yeah. Um, or it's people saying the, our, you know, the doctor has recommended Roaccutane. I'm really worried, and then I'll see. Send me a picture, and you can just you can tell. You can be like. Do not waste your money on this 600 pounds worth of stuff you've been given from a clinic. First of all, medical grade is bullshit. It doesn't exist. So stop with that. We need to stop with that as an industry because we can sell product without trying to make people think it's better than something else they can get, you know, on the high street. Because what you're doing is being elitist. And it really annoys me. Yeah. (laughs) It really annoys me. (laughs) But I mean, I said to someone this week. If this was my child, I would put them on Roaccutane. And I do not say that easily. And obviously I say I'm not a doctor. They will have to have the full medical history. But if your derm is already recommending it, I'm assuming, I'd go with yeah. it. If it's, if they send me a picture and it's, you know, what my daughter would do when she was sort of 15, I've got acne, but she's got a few hormonal spots around of the course. chin, then I'll recommend product. I'm like, well, ask them how often they're changing their pillowcases. Mm. You know, if they're at uni, it's do they ever change their pillowcase? Who are they snogging and how often? And is it different people? Because that will affect all around here. I don't need to know. I'm just saying ask them. (laughs) I don't want to know your kid's life, but. um, And it's just strange things like that that a lot of people don't think of. It's, you know, it's kind of all the superfluous stuff that you do too. Are they partying? Do they smoke? Are they eating crap? Because ultimately you could say, of course, and I'm not a dietitian or a nutritionist, but I can you know, I once told someone the direction that they blew the smoke out of their mouth based on their skin when I gave her a facial. I said, how many, how long many years have you been smoking? She went, oh my God, do I smell? I was like, no, not at all. I can tell by your skin. And she was obviously, smokers really don't think you can tell. Everyone who's trained in skincare can immediately go. 
Do you know if vaping has an effect on your skin? Vaping's worse. Worse. Vaping is worse for your skin. Yeah. So this this woman, I said, do you have quick fag breaks outside work? And she was like, yes. And she, you could tell she was like, this woman's been stalking me. And I said, do you do this? And she went, oh my God. <laughs> I said, because your center panel is about 15 years older than the side. And she was like, I'm, I'm never going to smoke again. I'm done. I was like, <laughs> good, you, good. <laughs> that's that done, mate. <laughs> but no, you, looks you too can, for me. <laughs> you, you can tell, you know, you can meet smokers who have good skin, but it won't, you're just, oh, why would you do it? Don't do it, mm. you know. But yeah, vaping is bad. And what, for the situation that you recommended pro, for product, mm-hmm. so rather than any of the other solutions, what product that you can buy would you recommend for someone with, who's currently having acne issues well the first thing i do is say if it's a mum i say what have you already got at home because if they follow me they've probably bought a lot of kits and i'm all about people not spending money if they don't need to so i'm like what have you got at home just take a picture of everything don't try and list it just take a picture um and if they if they're just like you know i've only ever used ponds or ole or there's nothing wrong with that but that's not going to help your team with their acne and so it's usually okay we're going to start with a gentle cleanser. You don't have to go crazy. And I know you don't want to spend a lot of money. Um, although parents of teens who have problem skin, that's never an issue for them. You know, they might say we have a budget concern. That's different. That's completely different. Uh, and it's usually an acid. Bring an acid into the mix, a salicylic acid. A, a, an easy cleanser, a salicylic acid, and a very, very light, usually oil-free moisturizer. And that's kind of where you would start from. If they've already tried that and nothing's working is when I sort of send them off to people. And would you recommend that as well for someone who's, for a non-teen situation? So someone in their mid-20s who's yeah, getting for sure, acne? for sure. Yeah, if, if, I mean, acne is something you're never going to see on packaging mm. because it's a medical term. So you can't make any claims with things like acne, rosacea. They're medical conditions. So half the time it's educating people just on that alone. You know, people go into a Boots or a super drug and they're like, I can't find anything for acne. And I'm, I'm like, well, you're not going to because they can't legally say it. And it's usually the American brands that get into trouble for doing it. <laughs> but yeah, acids, you know, like peels that will break down the spots, things like that. I've seen a lot online recently about tretinoin. Mm-hmm. Should, and generally people getting it any which way in order to help mm-hmm. their skin. What types of people should be on tretinoin? People with acne. And people who are older, like my age, that have signs of aging, they're not happy with. You don't need to be on TRET when you're in your 20s. Mm. A lot of people will use it, but you don't need to be. Most people, so there's, there's, there's sort of professional services that are much more affordable than a derm like Dermatica and Skin in Me that very cleverly set up almost like an online dermatologist. So you send your pictures in and they'll give you a prescription and you get it monthly and then you have to send in pictures for updates. Now, obviously this is never gonna be a perfect science because a derm is, if you have a real condition, they're gonna wanna see you in the flesh, you know? So for that reason, they can't, for example, treat younger people. Why would they? That seems very good sense, you know? Um, but they, they will generally recommend certain ingredients for acne, rosacea, and pigmentation. They're the big ones. The big ones are sort of pigmentation, especially at this time of year, you know, when the, everyone's been out in the sun. Right. Pigmentation, acne, signs of aging, you know, that kind of thing. But yeah. it's, you don't need to be on TRET if you're in your mid-20s. Yeah, I have, I use skin in me. I also work with them, full disclosure. But I, they change my skin, yeah. like completely transform my skin. And that's coming from a point of view of someone who's, who has the resources to afford Yeah you know well it was like 20 quid a month i think it's gone up to like 30 quid a month now well well, right for the dispenser which i always full disclosure because i'd worked with them skin Mm. me and dermatica in the last few years Mm. but i um i use them after the expiry date i don't care i'm sorry i'm 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 glad you did too oh Oh, yeah you feel great i'm a bit cheap ultimately i'm a bit cheap (laughs) my boyfriend asked one time whether he could borrow my uh moisturizer and i got to the end of my daily doser from my skin and me really early and I was like that's weird they've not put enough product in it turns out he'd be using my tretinoin oh, as wow. moisturizer and was, I was it like, skin dry well I was like this just goes to show that men are always fine because the- wow. <laughs> I was like wow okay make me feel bad about my skin <laughs> so were you acneic when you were younger not not even when I was younger I suddenly oh. a few years ago right. about five years ago I think it was just yeah it would have been exactly five years ago actually suddenly out of nowhere i mean i was in a very high stress situation Mm. but like 
just got really terrible skin mm. and could never get rid of it to the point like as in and got really terrible scarring yeah. i also have keloid scarring so like it generally makes my scarring worse right. like wherever whenever yeah. um and just like out of nowhere got really terrible skin and as someone you know i've been very fortunate to be in the position where i have the resource to be able to you know go to dermatologists go to facialists like whatever it might be nothing was solving this like i tried so many different things and i'm sure it would have just been you know not trying one route long enough or whatever it might be but the effect that skin and me had so i mean i'm literally like the biggest brand stand purely because i I didn't know you were them it it genuinely i mean it genuinely like changed my life within a year for my my that's the thing about people with bad skin Mm. it is debilitating your mental health suffers i just yeah i just literally i literally could not i mean I consider myself a very resilient person and I was obviously like getting through it, but I could not believe how much it affected my mental health, Mm -hmm. purely being able to, and even like consuming social media. I'd look at people on social media being like, oh, I'm struggling with my skin at the moment. And I'd feel venomous. You're like, I'd be like, how dare you? (laughs) Be like, block. (laughs) But like genuinely, it it like affects, it affected so many different things and it affected like, yeah it, it just like was such an attack on the psyche and it sounds so it ridiculous is. and if no, you i is. don't think if you if, if you haven't experienced yeah, it you don't it, know it, i got i got acne when i was like about 40 and now i know of course that it was the onset of perimenopause right i piled on the weight i got acne uh constant brain fog all that sort of stuff and i ha- i mean i fixed it myself but i had to literally change my products complete 180 mm. i'd always use like richer products for drier skin i had to stop all of it mm. um it's balanced out now i'm dry again now but i'm postmenopausal, mm. so you would expect it but it, it is debilitating it's not even you know when i say skin problems and when i talk about acne stuff it's not i don't even mean um it's it's for what is a problem for you and yeah, I spend a lot of time telling people, look, your skin is actually fine. You're, you've got a few hormonal mm. spots. It's going to happen. Is it worth you completely changing your skincare for it? Probably not. Mm. You know, some people I say, just buy a good concealer and let it ride itself out, mm. you know. But if it's affecting someone really badly, then yeah, I say, go and, go and see a facialist. Mm. Go and see this facialist. They specialize in laser. Go to a derm. And I recommend derms to people all the time, but I can only do that if they live near London. You know, mm. I don't have a walking directory for the rest of the UK, of sadly, which yeah. people do shout at me about. I'm like, I don't know what you want me to do. Yeah. I don't know what you want me to do. I can put something on Insta and say, does anyone know a brilliant dermatologist? But then in... I have to taste, trust their recommendation. Then you have to trust and... them. Yeah. <laughs> Could exactly. be their mum. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> them being like, <laughs> Um. So then moving on from the, well, kind of moving on from the acne, what would you recommend for someone who's struggling then with acne scarring? So I've had I, as I said, had really bad skin for five years. It's ne- it's suddenly in just like, it cleared up from the point I started using skin and me and then just like suddenly stopped. Um, I assume it's something hormonal. I also have PCOS. So there's probably like some something yeah. there. Um, but I now have significant scarring. Mm-hmm. What products that you can, and I, I am seeing a dermatologist from now and I'm kind of generally just trying to get as much like advice as possible, trying some peels, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but what would you recommend for someone on a lower budget who needs to tackle acne scarring? It depends how bad the acne scarring is because if it's already gone to the color of your skin, you are gonna have to go and see someone and there isn't a cheap way of doing it. You are gonna have to go and have either laser or microneedling fraction, like depends. Um, if you've got acne scarring and it's their pink, for example, um, it, it, you can help them heal. And again, you won't find the word heal on packaging because that's a medical term, but you that's essentially what you're trying to do. You can do that with things like a tretinoin. You know, you can do that with vitamin A's and retinoids. It's a slower process, but if you get in there early and do it, you can, and acids. Acids and vitamin A's generally are good in that case. It's different if, for example, you fall and bang your head and you've got a scar from a cut, a laceration. Then there are products like, there's a brand called Kela Coat, um, which is almost literally like a coating that you put on that helps the scar heal. That's a very different scar. Is that specifically for keloid? Yeah. Mm, uh, and and sort of lighter ones too. Yeah. But Kela Coat is like a... Uh, you know, that's affordable. That's in like a Boots, mm. uh, Amazon, I think. Amazing. I worked with them last year, but I can't remember. I don't work with them now. But, you know, so <laughs> things like that, it's worth, you know, when people say, it's usually like my mum's had an accident, my dad's had an accident, my daughter's had an accident, and I say, send me a picture. 
And if they've still got the stitches and I'm like, you're going to have to wait until that comes out. Like, please <laughs> relax. Yeah. I like that you're thinking ahead, but I'm not a doctor. Yeah. Like, you know, relax. Yeah. But generally it's, is it to treat a one-off big scar or are we talking about lots of where you've had breakouts and they've left scarring behind? Then mm. that's different. Yeah. And should everyone be on a retinoid? No. No. Although there are a lot of derms, especially American derms who would say yes. Mm. But if you've got, if you're happy with your skin and you've got a good skin, why would you try and speed up the renewal process? Because that's essentially what it does. It speeds up the renewal process. So, and there's only so many times your face can go around the sun, as they say. <laughs> so if your skin is already renewing in the right way, you've got you good shouldn't skin, be... leave it. Just take care of it. Use an SPF. You know, have a little bit of an intervention if you get a breakout or things like that. Or if you've got a bit of sensitivity or you have a reaction to things. You know, people have allergies and things like that then by all means treat it then, but you don't need to immediately go down the road of a vitamin A. It's a fantastic ingredient, don't get me wrong, but you know, if you're in your 30s, 40s, 40s for sure, 30s, I would still say it depends on your life, your lifestyle and that kind of thing, but equally you're pushing against people who sometimes just want to. Of course. And that's what I've learned to just go, if you want to, knock yourself out, Shazza. Yeah. <laughs> enjoy enjoy i want to speak a little bit about medical grade products and i know that you say that that is a load of shite mm -hmm. correct yeah um could you explain that because i've definitely had a lot of medical grade yeah. stuff thrown my way so essentially in the uk in particular there is <laughs> there is over the counter products so stuff that you can buy from boots from space and k from john lewis anywhere online, you know, and all the brands that you could think of, everything from an Estee Lauder to a Beauty Pie to a Skin Rocks to a, you know, The Ordinary, mm. anything like that is just a normal, it's called a cosmetic. It's a cosmetic product legally. And then you've got prescription meds, which you would get from a derm, you know, tretinoin, uh, certain types of blends of antibiotic creams and azelaic acids that are stronger and things like that. And then in between, you've got usually it's a doctor derm office sometimes with an esthetician like a facialist on the side and they've got a wall full of product sometimes they put it behind a glass case and say that you can only have that with our advice but actually you can you don't it's just that that's how they decide to market their brand so mm. calling it medical grade because the claims they make they're the only ones who did clinical trials that's not true i clinically trialed my cleanser i do clinical trial and everything hey, right <laughs> So, you I'll know, your job. yeah. And why, why more brands in the open sort of market don't do it? I don't know because it's not extortionate. It's costly, of course, but it's not extortionate. There's no excuse for brands not to do it, you know? So, uh, that the products penetrate deeper. It's not true. You know, to go past a certain point, you need a needle. And unless you're going to inject that moisturizer into your face with a needle, which I don't advise, which I don't advise and you can't do, then that's also not the case. Um, what you will get in that situation is a cohesive routine, mm. but it'll cost you more money sure. and you're not guaranteed a result. Mm. So if it's, if it's medical grade, there's no legal context for it. It's marketing. And it annoys me because I want to wholly support the professional industry of facialists. But when they start towing that line of this is medical grade, we put in. Now, obviously, there is going to be more active. I would hope... <laughs> there are going to be more active ingredients and a higher percentage of ingredients mm. in something that you would buy from a professional than the ordinary. That's true. But the ordinary is five pounds and you're going to try and sell someone something that's 150. Right. The difference has to be astronomical to my mind for me to say, yes, I would buy this. Mm. You know, so there are certain brands that choose to sell only in professional outlets. That's absolutely your choice. But let's not bullshit people and tell them it's because boots wouldn't be able to sell it right so it's exclusive rather than legally restricted oh yeah that's so interesting and elitist I never it's elitist that. yeah no absolutely and but really that, annoying yeah i but that doesn't include things like skin and me no skin and me is a prescription right okay and dermatica the same business same mm. you know not same business same business model is a prescription yeah so if you if you need a prescription for it it's a drug everything else on the market everything else is a cosmetic everything else yeah that's so interesting before we end i would like to know from you five products oh god specifically your desert island skincare products 
by the brand or just what it would be? No, no, oh, by God. the brand. Okay, I need to sit up for this. Five products. All right, let's get there. Oh, don't knock that. That's it. I need to lie down and think about this. A cleansing balm, number one. Um, uh, well, my, my sort of standard go-to has been Emma Hardy for years. Emma okay. Hardy Moringa Cleansing Balm, I've used it for years. Um, there are other brilliant balms on the market. I could name 20, but top of my head, that would be the one most people who followed me for years would go, she's going to say Emma Hardy. <laughs> um, acid. Well, the, my favorite acid is P50 by Biologique Recherche, the 1970 version, which you can't even buy in the EU anymore because it's too strong. That's why I like it. Perfect. Your face tingles, burns, and then goes bright red, but the next day your skin looks like you've had a head full of Botox. But you can really... Off I go to the internet. Yeah, you won't get it. It's Off usually... I go to America. Yeah, you have to go to New York. <laughs> yeah. So I've got that on tap, but I wouldn't use it every day. You know, it's too much, but it's a fantastic... It's just because it was innovative, you know, and I trained in biology research 20 years ago, and it was uh, just a really good education. Um, oh, God. Uh, retinoid. I'll use my Skin Rocks Retinoid too just because if I don't say something by my own brand, my team will kill me. And it's also great. It's a fantastic retinoid, yeah. let's be honest. Um, uh, moisturizer, um, only because I'm not going to sit here like those people who go, oh, I only use my own product. I hate that. Uh, Kate Somerville, Peptide Kate, but you don't need that, you're 26. I need it. I am more than double your age, kill me now. Um, and then... <laughs> I love that your team are laughing. My lot are like, that's what she's like. Um, so yeah, I've had, a, I should say SPF, but I'm on a desert island and I can't get off. I don't give a shit anyway. If, right. it was a, if it was SPF, it'd be like, I like ultraviolet, supreme screen. But if I could drop SPF because I'm, you know, don't get me wrong. No one really wants to use an SPF every day. Right, it's, it's just a drag, central, yeah. you know, it, but you, it's almost like putting on knickers. Mm. If you want to go commando every day, knock yourself out. I don't mm. know many women who do, but knock yourself out. Mm. Um, eye cream. Autocorrect Sunday Riley. I don't work with any of those brands. None of them endorse me to say this. Now they're all going to make a pretty penny. That's fine. Yeah, Just send it to me for free. <laughs> yeah. Please. <laughs> so I yeah, like, like Hardy, um, P50, Autocorrect, Deep Tissue Repair and Retinoid 2 would probably sort me out if I was like, okay, you have to do this. If that's like my version of like Table Manor's Desert Island Meal. Great. What about you? Oh God. Aha. Sorry. <laughs> Aha, the coin turns. <laughs> Shit. Yeah. How the tables have turned. Um, okay. So there would have to be my skin and me daily doser in there. Yeah. Sounds like an ad. Genuinely What's in your prescription? Life. Do you know? Tretinoin. Um, Azelaic or niacinamide Azelaic or something. Yeah. yeah. And niacinamide. Nice. I think. Great. You should work nice. with them. 10 out of 10. <laughs> You've done my prescription in one. So that would definitely be in there because nothing has ever affected my skin more. Um, your moisturizer, not just because I'm sitting opposite you, it's but it's really, really, really Do you use good. Use fragrance free or fragranced? Uh, fragrance free. Um, I am a bit in general. I'm weird about fragrances mm -hmm. anyway. Like I'm allergic to some fruits and stuff, mm -hmm. so I just find it mm -hmm. best to avoid. And also, if you've had skin problems, sometimes yeah. it's easier just to not wager it. You know, I, do, I might as well not. Um, so that I also find that w weirdly, with a lot of even sensitive skin moisturizers. I, after I've used my daily doser because it's got actives in it, I find it tingles yeah. and yours doesn't, um, which is great. Um, you know why? Why? Because I didn't pump it full of hyaluronic acid because hyaluronic acid can be really, Is that really, what it is? Yeah, you want glycerin, not hyaluronic acid. Interesting. Did you see I put on my story the other day saying that I switched to yours from something that I paid double the amount for no. and had been, yeah, Damn and it. had been- Missed that. I know, well- you know, got to, some, sometimes you don't tag so that people know you're being honest. I know, I do like, that. I really But promise. then do you know what happens, like, not to interrupt you, but what happens is if you don't tag, people go, where can I buy this? Right, It's just sure. easier to tag. Yeah, no, I just exactly. tag. I mean, I said the name, said, it showed the photo. <laughs> um, but it's exactly that. It's, I switched from something I paid double the amount for and had been using for about three years. So oh, interesting. Yeah. Good. You, you got it is a coin. brilliant moisturizer. It really is. I just didn't want to put two of my products in. It yeah, felt no, a bit so like. Yeah, fair enough. So I'll put it in mine. You're welcome. You're welcome. <laughs> um, then on the SPF, I yeah, really I love, believe I do very love strongly SPF. in SPF. Um, and also I think it's probably because it's something that I have actually done right for quite a few years. Yeah. And I like to, you know, you can that, tell that's that, that's good for my <laughs> ego generally to have been right in it. So um, SPF, there's a few that I like. I probably would always go back to the La Roche Posay one. And Thelios, the white shape. Yeah, the funny shape one. Yeah, I, I I like it. I do think it's a little bit overhyped. Really, mm. 
I think it's just like it works. But it well is very makeup. light. It is very give it its due. La Roche Posay do amazing innovation in science. Yeah. They really do. It's more my skin type. Right. I need a bit more. I need a bit more butter on the bread. Yeah. So I really like <laughs> I also got the body shop one, gifted one. Fantastic. The 50 plus plus plus. Fantastic. One rebought that multiple times yeah and they've reformulated it they just sent it out last week it is really good interesting Off really good again yeah god my basket's gonna be heavy after this um then what would my fourth one be oh i know my fourth and fifth quarterly um vino perfect mm -hmm. the serum mm -hmm. is it vino perfect the mm -hmm. serum yeah that so i only for ages used cleanser moisturizer and just my daily doser in the evening nothing just mm -hmm. cleanser and moisturizer and spf in the morning then i introduced the vino perfect skin texture amazing good really really like that orderly love me at the moment because when brad pitt said and i quote you know no one was really doing anything with all of these grapes <laughs> and I was like, ding, ding, ding. Hello, ding, ding, ding. Has anyone heard of Cordially? But also, Hello. They were like, thank you so much. I was like, oh, come on. France, you were doing it 25, 30 years ago. France has made too much wine this year. It's literally all over the headlines. People are doing things with the grapes. Come like, on now. No, no one was really using grapes. I'm like, you're such an idiot. I'm using the grapes. And yours is like $300, $400 and Cordially have been here forever. Shut sit, take several seats, Brad. Several seats. Go and sort out your divorce and take several seats. <laughs> Come back later. <laughs> Carry on. That was number four. Um, number five is another quarterly and it's the Vino Pure, the cleanser. Mm -hmm. um, so I bought that purely because I'd used the Vino Perfect and really liked the serum. And then I was in the shop and I needed a, by the shop, I mean Space NK. I always mean Space NK when I say the shop. <laughs> um, and um, <laughs> They're going to love you. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I switched to that and made worlds of different for my skin. So I've that's now my perfect like capsule, that specific routine. Those nice. are the ones I repeat. Well, I'm in very good night. company, I'm thrilled. Have you used Cordelie's body lotion? No. Oh man. The body lotion, which there's there's two, there's like a thicker cream and then there's the body lotion that's like a milk out yeah. the pump. Top tier. Really? So nice. I could be, honestly, you could tell me anything Cordelie at the moment. And because of, I only saw it as and this is going to sound ridiculous i think it was one of those ones that i always saw like in my mum's bathroom mm. and so kind of just saw it as kind of like you know those like l'occitane like mm -hmm. some of those brands where you just see it as like a present brand yeah like I'd they do very it good as a gifting. christmas gift they do very good gifting you know at christmas. And you're I've gonna get a thought, lovely coffre exactly <laughs> and now all i want for gifting is quarterly that's nice um so if anyone's watching this and you know it's not my birthday or christmas coming up but I'm i do sure like i can hook you up <laughs> Well, I think that is a perfect place to end. <laughs> Thank you so much. I've learned so much. I've also lost so much money based on the fact that I will be going Sorry. straight to I can to always the do shop. cheaper alternatives. I can always do a cheaper alternative. No, no, as I've said, I prefer to spend more. It makes me feel okay, more good. effective. Thank you okay. so much. Um, no, but you've been absolutely amazing. You have taught me a lot. I feel like the people have learned a lot from this. Thank you. Um, and thank you for being, I mean, I'm sure you get this all the time, but you are such a brush, brush, sure. You know what I mean, but that's it. That's all you're getting. You are such a breath of fresh air in an industry that is amazing in lots of ways, but also can be very confusing and complex and just require hours and hours of research to actually get anywhere. Um, the time. Uh, exactly. And also like I'm in the shop right now. If you make I it need... difficult for me, I'm exactly, not going to Exactly. And, and you do not make it difficult for me. Um, hence why I have all your products. Um, I think it's great. Thank you so much for having me.